Well, welcome back to another Addy Hour episode. Of course, it's my pleasure to be able to continue these conversations on a lot of different topics, which I feel are really important for so many aspects of our lives. And today, really honored to be able to jump into a topic around children and youth. So really think about the next generation. And again, something that I think is very relevant for all of us, no matter at what level we interact with those in the generations coming up. So today, I'm honored to be able to welcome Dr. Michelle Borba, who is an internationally renowned educational psychologist who has published over 20 books. One of those books includes Unselfie, Why Empathetic Kids Succeed in Our All About Me World. Michelle is an expert in parenting, bullying, and character development, and she's spoken to over 1 million participants on five continents. So someone who has definitely gotten around and uh, really used that to inform her work. She's a regular NBC contributor who appears regularly on Today. She's also been featured as an expert on Dateline, The View, Dr. Phil, NBC Nightly News, Fox and Friends, Dr. Oz, and The Early Show, among many others. She also has a forthcoming book, which we'll be talking about as well. And she lives in Palm Springs, California with her husband, and it's also the mother of three grown sons. So that's one thing that was intriguing to me as well, given your work. I would love to hear, you know, to even meet your sons at some point, but that's that's a little bit of a tangent. But again, just want to welcome Dr. Michelle Borwitz to the Addy oh, Hour Podcast. Thank you. I have been so looking forward to this. I'm going to hire you as my new PR firm. Thank you. <laughs> I would take that up. <laughs> well, thanks so much for being here. And again, the work you do is so important. Um, thank you. But as my Good listeners, you. oh, I really appreciate that. Definitely appreciate that. Um, as my listeners know as well, one of the things that we really uh, just value on this podcast is the opportunity to kind of peel back the layers, as it were, even as we bring in so many experts. So I did want to start out just asking you how you're doing at this moment with everything that's going on in our world, especially with the things that have been unfolding um, in Ukraine and Russia as well. Well, I think I've been sobbing my way through the last three days with Ukraine. I, I just mm. uh, the abomination is just extraordinary. I have friends who adopted children from Ukrainian mm. uh, orphanages. The biggest concern right now is trying to get a hold of them. And um, they're trying to, there's so many hundreds of kids under the age of even four, mm. that they're trying to figure out how to get them enough food in order to get them across a 20 mile, a 20 hour walk. So that's been really hard. Uh, but you know, when I, the other thing though, I have to keep telling myself is, look to the other side. Mm -hmm. Otherwise I get too caught in Putin. And I looked at the mm -hmm. other side and I saw images of hundreds of shoes in Poland and waiting for kids when they got off the train, mm -hmm. to take shoes or the people in these other countries with signs saying, here I am, I've got a place for you to stay. That kind of a thing is just, mm -hmm. it gives you that there's that evil, but wow, is yeah. there humanity if we look for it? Yeah, I think that's so well said. We're seeing both sides of humanity in that way. And it, it's, I appreciate you just sharing that honestly too on, you know, how you're navigating that just to have a good place for yourself as well. Um, and I know that's something that's near and dear to your heart and something I've heard you speak about as well, even just the, in, in terms of um, compassion fatigue. And I was just curious, you know, how for any who I'm sure a lot of people have heard that term, but how does that actually relate to the moment that we're in as you shared so, so honestly about? I think we're all feeling it. It's absolutely, mm. if there was one universal diagnosis, it would be compassion fatigue. And what is it? Mm -hmm. it's, we all need relationships. We all crave empathy. And when social distancing kicked in and we all had to be face to face and we couldn't see our family and friends, that's what rejuvenates us. In the other hand, what happened was stress starts to build. And when stress keeps building and uncertainty is there, you very often dial your empathy down and the outcome is compassion fatigue. Mm -hmm. So when you see yourself being kind of, oh, I'm not quite already there or your energy level is low, uh, what I'm really trying to do is read books that I could get into and absolutely love. I just finished The Lincoln Highway and I fell in love with a, mm -hmm. an eight-year-old kid named Billy. I'm <laughs> going, my mm -hmm. God, is that kid resilient? <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. Or finding good, fun movies that you can mm -hmm. see a good side. I watch the news content and try to turn it off so that I can see a different view. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have been doing a lot of Zooming with people that I just really enjoy talking to because it helps me build up. I think we all need to do that. Find yeah. what works for you because you have to keep your empathy up and that yeah. stress level down. Yeah. Yeah. So important. And I feel like a lot of ways we've been trying to be creative about that as well. Um, some of the topics that we've even talked about on this podcast have been around just the importance of social bonding and how that activates mm -hmm. oxytocin in our brains and all those pieces. Mm -hmm. And 
you know, whether that's still there on Zoom or not, but there's just a different energy that comes from being in person. But at the same time, like you said, there are opportunities to be able to connect with people in ways that we hadn't done that before. So I appreciate you sharing how you're oh, navigating that journey yeah. as well. We just had to put our creativity into it. Well, that mm -hmm. didn't work. So what are we going to do instead? And if we keep just keep looking for the other options, uh, I think that's how we thrive. Yeah, yeah. And thrive. I'm glad you use that word because that's something we'll definitely come back to. <laughs> maybe that was intentional, maybe not. But as we think about your new uh, book as well. Part of my, this part of my vocabulary. Yeah, these yeah, days yeah. What are we going to do to keep on doing and raising thrivers? Yeah, so important. Before we jump there, I just also wanted to hear a little bit about your journey. Um, for those who may be familiar with you and those who aren't familiar with you, how did you, what, what started this passion to get into this area of child development and so many directions that you've taken it? Absolute fluke. I was a, wow. I was a history major. Wow. And I came home to, uh, I didn't expect that. <laughs> no, I came home to, to uh, interview my dad or just be with my dad from college for a weekend. And I never forget it. You will appreciate this. My dad was calm. He was cool. You know, the world war II veteran, the superintendent, he published books. He was quite uh, accomplished. But he was so upset that day and he was holding a Newsweek magazine and he was pacing the floor. He looked at me and he didn't expect my visit. And the cover of the magazine was the first three years of a child's life, make or break them. He mm. turned to me, pointed to it and said, don't buy into this, Michelle, because if this were true, I'd be dead today. Now, wow. I sat there with my mouth open because I didn't know anything about my dad's parents. Mm. They had passed away. I never met my grandparents. He sat me down and he said, this is what happened to me. His parents apparently came over very destitute, um, no English from Italy, tried desperately to be able to, to jumpstart and wanted to give their kids the best they could. My, my dad was the youngest of five. Mm -hmm. But my father, grandfather, went and became a coal miner and then died when my dad was two. Wow. And the only way that his extremely loving mother could afford the children and keep them alive was to put them in an orphanage. Mm. So he said, wow. my dad said, OK, now I'm in an orphanage. My mom is destitute. I didn't know what was going on, but he said it was the people who saved me. The nuns had such empathy for me, Michelle. That was the first thing, those nuns. When they released me, my mom got a little more money. It was the local librarian. She'd sneak books to me. Mm. Danny would read this. The, the neighbor next door would help me rake and give me a little bit extra money. A teacher would pull me aside and say, I think you could be a good writer. He said, my proudest moment was when I got my scholarship from Stanford and UC Berkeley to walk mm. in and say, thank you very much. Don't buy into it, Michelle. People can make or break your life. I went back and changed wow. my major to child development. So wow. I was there, found this amazing piece of research by Emmy Werner, and that started my whole career. Emmy wow. Warner substantiated what my dad said. She started to interview, uh, oh gosh, 40, uh, just for 40 years, she studied the same 700 children who shouldn't mm. have made it. Extreme adversity in their life. But one third of them, even by their teens years, was bouncing back and she discovered mm. the same thing. Caring people in their lives, that would what my dad said. And then somebody had taught them protective buffers or coping strategies. Mm -hmm. And as a result, they made it and that changed my whole career. Okay. Wow. Wow. That is true that we got to get wow. this information out to people. Yeah. That's such a powerful story. And I love that it has a, a family connection um, as well. And it sounds like just in that moment, there was a shift and a, a passion oh, that emerged. It was an amazing shift. And later on, he said, Michelle, you should be a special ed teacher. That's how I ended up in special ed. Everything I learned from every part of my so-called career mm. was from kids. Mm. They, uh, it wasn't the textbook. It was the kids who convinced mm -hmm. me, boy, this is doable stuff. Yeah. The hands-on real life experience. Wow. Wow. Definitely appreciate that. And as you were, as you were getting into the work, um, how did people respond to you? Were people, because in the same way, it seems like there could be a mixed reaction. Either people would be really excited about it or did people ask you why, why this route? Why this route? You know, interestingly enough, you're probably one of the few people that ask why this route. So thank you very much. I, my goal is, it, it's funny, I just took a very slow path of a trajectory. Whenever mm. a phone call would ring or something, mm -hmm. I went into a different director. I got my master's in learning disabilities. Mm. And then I, I found this passion for educational psychology. That's where I got my doctorate. Mm -hmm. I never planned to write a book. But oh, I had wow. one of my professors tell me I should. And then once 
I wrote the book, I never planned to be a speaker, but somebody called up and said, we need you to speak. So it was saying yes to Mm -hmm. all of these little avenues along the way. And I'm so glad I did. Yeah. And it seems like it's tapped into your passion that was already there too. And so in a sense, you were poised and ready for the opportunities that came because you're already following that passion, which I think is well, really I have no idea on how critical it is to find that passion. What's your joy? What do you just mm. absolutely love to do? And just helping kids and working with families, no matter where I am, is is my passion. And mm. I had the absolute amazing opportunity to work on, uh, I think, five continents now. I'm up to 23 countries. Wow. And what I've learned from it is no matter where you are, everybody has the same loves and concerns and desires for their kids. So it works no matter where we are. Let's all yeah. work together. We're just all neighbors. Yeah, that's so important, especially with everything we've been yeah. walking through in the last few years, too. Would you say that was that a surprise to you, or do you think that you expected to, to see that that commonality? Um, well, travel has broken every stereotype I had of life. Mm. If we could all travel more. Mm. Mm-hmm. Uh, it helps you no matter where you are. Uh, just be far more open and realize they're just like me, no matter mm. where I am. I don't care if it's religion, education, mm. uh, you know, race, color, creed. Oh my gosh, people are wonderful. My best friends have got them all over the world. And um, I just got another call from Abu Dhabi this morning and said, can you come back? Oh, I'd love to come back. Just wow. So fun. Yeah, that's so powerful. I mean, it speaks to this, the global community that we have in a sense too. And even as you were sharing about your dad's story, it was just making me think about the community that he had around him all those people who are sewing into his life in different ways and giving him encouragement, the empathy, the empowerment. I think that's, that's so critical and so encouraging to hear that the way that you've built that into your work, even as one individual who has traveled to all these places and has learned so much and is really sharing that with so many of us. I love Susan Pinker's book, the village effect, because Mm. she said, if you really want to boost empathy, which is to me, the social glue that holds us all together, Mm -hmm. remember that villages of about 150 people are the maximum of what kids really need in order to create that community. And Mm -hmm. what we've done is we've, we busted the villages and we're these huge, huge suburban areas. One of my favorite things to do is, is uh, as I'm driving from, I don't care if it's Sri Lanka or in New York, I purposely go through an area and I can go from a rural area, drive through and I watch the facial expressions and they look like they're happy. And then all of a sudden, as I go into a bigger area in an urban area, a little bit more stress comes mm-hmm. in. So Maybe the first thing is we just got to capture each other and realize we are the support system. Let's get back to what we all need for optimum mental health. And as parents, let's also look at what we're modeling. Mm -hmm. Are we modeling thinking outside the box, exposing Mm -hmm. our children to differences, letting them be exposed to how many wonderful other opportunities they are? Mm -hmm. Um, You know, there's a great study that also said during the pandemic, the kids who seemed to fare a little better were the kids who didn't take the bus from New York to their school, but walked through the park in order to get to their school. Mm -hmm. Just those simple, ordinary things. Um, I'll mention one thing when I was writing on resilience. I've been Mm -hmm. trying to study this for 40 years after my dad. It's one of the best books I also read was by Ann Maston. Mm -hmm. She's from the University of Minnesota. And what she did was she discovered when she did the same thing of kids growing up in extreme adversity is that ordinary things can make extraordinary differences on children's lives. Mm -hmm. And when I looked at what do you mean by the ordinary things, like the walk through the park, like prayer, like Mm -hmm. a sense of humor, uh, like a some kind of a, a talent or a hobby or an interest, knowing who I've got one friend. And I looked at that and said, that's what seems to be a problem. What we've got is ordinary things mm-hmm. being removed a lot from our children's lives. And maybe we just need to reboot. Yeah. And uh, it's not just the GPA that's going to help our kids in this world. It's yeah. those ordinary things that help fill them and are going to be really good decompressors mm-hmm. to help mm-hmm. them get along with life. Yeah. So, so many things that you said that I'd love to unpack and I'll pick a few, but even as you're talking about those ordinary things, and those small things, I mean, as a neuroscientist, even thinking about what we understand about the brain and having the brace and just the things in our environment that can bring us pleasure. And even as we can engage in our day-to-day activities, how can that really can help us navigate and just have a place of mental um, health wellness. And I think oftentimes we talk about that in adult circles. We don't always, I think as much as we need to really think about that for children and youth where it's even that much more important, especially from a developmental standpoint. So it's great, great that you've been paying attention to that and to elevate that as well. 
Oh, you know, I, one of the things that when you asked, what am I looking forward to right now is I'm finally being able to get back on the road and go and visit schools. Mm -hmm. And the best thing I get to do before I talk to the big school district is do focus groups with teens. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. They just are so extraordinary. Once they know that whatever they say, it's going to be, uh, there's no judgment. Just tell me. So I've been trying to figure out and ask them, you know, what's causing all of this stress mm -hmm. and what are the solutions for it? And one kid I just came from uh, College Station, Texas. He said, we are so stressed. But the thing is that nobody's teaching us how to de-stress. Mm. And it doesn't isn't something you learn on a worksheet. And it's not like a one-time health unit. The big thing you guys, you guys have got to mm -hmm. do yeah. is give us a repertoire of stuff. And then we choose what works for us. And then we have got to practice that over and over and over and over until we can do it without you. I went, mm. Oh my gosh. Wow. Text that's so insightful. Like, what yep. I want. <laughs> I said, so if you're going to make us do that deep breathing stuff, that's cool. But don't just tell us what it is every single day. We should practice that maybe two minutes a day. Mm. Yeah. That's wow. exactly. We can be doing that at home. Yep. When we say we're so tired, no, we got two minutes a day. Mm -hmm. Just practice one thing until it becomes a new family habit. I, mm -hmm. I say that one because one of the coolest places I ever worked was on army bases, mm. uh, 18 of them. And the commanders kept telling me, you should go talk to the Navy SEALs. I said, why? He says, because we're retraining them to get through some really tough adverse times. And I'm going, that's for sure. So when I asked the Navy SEALs, I said, what are you guys doing? He said, three things. And you better tell kids this, because this is really helping us and it's actually proven to rewire our brains. Okay, what's one? We figure out what our stress signs are and we start mm -hmm. pointing it out to each other. We don't wait till the meltdown. We we point exactly. them out. Hey, you start grinding your teeth or you start going like this or I can see, you know, your heart popping up and down. We could do that to our kids. Mm -hmm. Not that you're going to get time out, but just have you noticed mm -hmm. that right before you go to do the time test, this is what you do. Then they say, we tell ourselves, chill out or relax. And then we take a one, two breath, slow two breath from our abdomen, nothing new, mm -hmm. but it's slow two breath way like we're riding up an elevator, keep focusing on the breath, hold it, and then slowly let it out. So the exhale is twice as long as the inhale. You see Berkeley says that's exactly what works. Yeah. Why don't we teach that to kids? Doesn't cost a dime. Yeah. Yeah. So important. And on that note, I'm curious because even as you're talking about the focus groups with the teens, it seems like there's a push and pull. I mean, even the, you know, the, the kids that I've talked to in schools and having kids myself too, it seems like sometimes there's just different places that people are at. So I'm curious what your view is of where those mental health conversations are for kids. Because sometimes I get the sense that the kids are thinking about it more than the administrators or the teachers. And not to downplay the efforts that the administrators and teachers are putting in, but it seems like sometimes there's a disconnect, almost as if kids and youth are more ready to move into it than we give them credit for. Now, I guess I'm answering the question as I'm saying it, but I'm curious oh, if no, that's I'm, been I, your perception. I knew we would agree on anything you comes out of your mouth <laughs> is going to come out of mine. And I think that's what's happening right now is the pandemic aftermath. Mm -hmm. We knew that it was going to be a stressful for us all. But now when we're looking at, okay, now we can get back to normal. I think we ought to put the red flag up and go, really? What's mm -hmm. going on with the kids? The first thing that the kids are saying that I had seen, but they're now admitting their motivation is lower. Their mm -hmm. focusing abilities are lower. And this is the top performing kids. Mm -hmm. These are, uh, we're more irritable. We can't handle the stress. We're not sleeping as well as we used to. So when you put all that together, the last mm -hmm. thing you're going to be able to do is they sit there for three hours and keep going. They said, exactly. you've got to reinvent a little bit. That homework load are just astronomical on us. We really are having a tough time. Mm -hmm. uh, and we really need to know feel comfortable going and talking to the counselors. Many mm -hmm. of the counselors have been, they're wonderful, they said, but they've been they have been really helping us prior to coming in with our GPAs and our getting to college. Mm -hmm. You want us to now open up and tell them how upset we are or how much in pain we are. We get to build trust. Mm -hmm. I, I love the comments they came up with because they're just, you know, you could read any psychology book and it's exactly the same. Exactly, thing. yeah. I think yeah. the first thing is we are seeing a regression in behavior patterns. If I was to ask any uh, teacher or counselor or headmaster, what are you seeing? Kid regression, more disrespect mm -hmm. is coming up. More uh, the whole society is disrespectful. The adults have been behaving very badly. I think it's spilling over to the kids. Mm -hmm. But the second thing is uh, 
inability to really, uh, th- that motivation and the perseverance isn't there. Mm-hmm. But in all fairness, you can't have the perseverance unless you have the self-control, yeah. unless you have the confidence and they all kind of work together, as you know. So yeah. you have to start with where the kids are. Yeah, I think that's so so well said. One of the episodes we had recently was, again, more of the causal, but someone who's an expert in trauma-informed teaching and learning too. And just acknowledging all the things that the kids have gone through and how, like you said, that's going to affect their yeah. actions in the classroom, but not ignoring that and trying to just push beyond it, but being aware of that too. What do you say to parents and teachers though? Because I know sometimes the comments that comes back, the comments that come back, people say, well, I'm here to teach. I'm not a therapist. I don't know how to navigate this. And so even though, as you're saying appropriately, we need to push beyond just the GPA piece. Sometimes people find that very difficult to break outside of that. Do you have tips that you try and share yeah, the in most those situations? Thing, for instance, I'm going to Indiana tomorrow. And mm-hmm. what I'm trying to do is when I talk to the teachers, it's mm-hmm. all about, I know you're teaching, don't stop the lesson, but let's find simple little ways to weave in these things. For instance, mm-hmm. as you're talking, you know that your kid's attention spans, I don't care if they're 17 or three or shorter. So take brain breaks. And that is don't talk for 50 minutes. Instead, let's talk for 10 minutes. And then let's take a 30 second turn to your partner. What's one thing you just heard? Mm -hmm. You're going to get more retention from your kids or just pick up your pencil and draw one little thing that the teacher just said. That's one thing. One of the best things I've ever seen is quiet time that's being done in the Oakland schools. Mm -hmm. What they did brilliantly was shave off one minute of each class time, just one Mm -hmm. minute of each class time. Now you have five minutes at the beginning of every single day. Five minutes at the beginning of every single day, every kid in the entire school and the teachers do one, two breathing. Uh, You can veg if you want to. Half the kids are Mm -hmm. sleeping for the first time. (laughs) You can choose meditation if you choose Mm -hmm. to. But here's the fabulous thing. They've been tracking it. Mm -hmm. Parties are going down. Suspensions are going down. Behavior problems are going down. Test scores went through the roof. They did absolutely nothing different than Let's just focus on what the kids seem to need. Let's teach them how. Let's have a counselor come in and show you how to do a one-two breath. And it made mind-boggling differences. Mm. So it's not that you're stopping teaching. Exactly. You're going with where your students are, trying to get them more engaged because they're not. They're also, by the way, more risk adverse. They're Mm. afraid to raise their hands. They're they're really social anxieties up with Mm -hmm. our kids because they've been facing a screen for so long. Mm -hmm. So a simple thing I also tell a teacher, you can tell them at home. The first thing is Mary Bud Rowe, brilliant researcher. She said, you want to ask a question? Ask the question. Then stop and pause and don't say anything for at least three seconds. Mm -hmm. Because the average one of us says something immediately. So what's the answer? If you wait three seconds, you'll get every kid to say something. The kid who wouldn't have said anything is going to open his mouth and say, you know, maybe a word. The other kid who would have said something is now going to give you a dissertation, but it's time to wait <laughs> mm-hmm. and think can be critical. And the final thing is our expectations. Parents, it's like a rubber band. Your goal is to figure out what your kid is capable of right this minute. If you don't know, ask the teacher. But mm-hmm. Line your expectations up and then gently keep stretching him. Gently. Don't snap him because you'll snap his spirit, but you keep stretching one step more and one step more and mm. one step more. Just little things that's using the research that don't mean it's another program, but it means we can make a difference on how our kids are more engaged, better performers, better behaviors, and their confidence will also yeah. go up. Yeah, that's so powerful on so many levels. I mean, and just to hear the outcomes too, even though some of those things weren't the focus, but just having that five minute pause time, how it had so many yeah. positive effects in so many ways. I'm curious, you know, as I'm listening to you, talk through those things. And because a lot of what we've talked about has been on college and university campuses, I'm curious how much there's a resetting of expectations because you even talked about that from parents. But one thing that I've also noticed is sometimes helping students reset their own expectations because sometimes they're setting them too high yes, or something that pre-COVID, something that's not attainable, falling short of it, feeling guilty yes. and anxious they didn't meet those goals and still, and then getting stuck in a cycle where they get further and further away from those. Are there any aspects of that that you also see um, at younger ages as well, even as you've talked about the parents setting expectations, what about the kids themselves? Oh, all across the board. Their expectations, they say, fascinating of what do you need? I guess the first thing is, what do you need from your parents? Mm. The number one thing I get from the kids oh, is, I would you please tell them to just say that you love me for who I am and don't quit mm. asking me about the grade because we are so worried about 
letting our parents down. I mm. know they're worried about us, but we are really, really scrambling to get it together. If you take one step more, you can teach goal setting to kids, but goal setting is don't aim to hear a good coach of an Olympic athlete never said you're going to get a gold medal tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. What's your time today? And then you teach them one step more and one step more and one step more. Or you have a child who's overwhelmed. Oh, my gosh, because of the anxiety. So what you do there is you tell them to chunk the task. And that is, let's look at it all. OK, don't go worried about the whole thing. Let's do the first row or the second row. Or is there one thing on that whole sheet that is your stumbler? Mm -hmm. This example, I taught piano as a kid, and Mr. White drove me to early retirement on the piano. You still he remember his name. <laughs> oh, my God, Mr. White. If you made one mistake, wherever you were, you had to start all over again. So what I would do was only focus on the mistake. My stress mm -hmm. level was so high that I started to hate piano. Bless Miss mm. Thompson. She was my next teacher. And what she had is a whole different approach. Mm -hmm. She'd identify my stumbler. So one little thing that's getting in your way, Michelle, let's just practice that little bar over and over and over. Now you're fine. Now start at the beginning. Mm -hmm. well, now I'm relaxed. And that's what a good coach does. Yeah. They yeah. never say you might as well quit. You can't do it right. No, let's look at the video. Oh, your foot's going the wrong way. Let's just practice your foot going that mm -hmm. way. See, the goal is to take all those little evidence-based strategies. Not them all, or your kid will never let you read another book. <laughs> yeah. One little thing at a time. A time. Yeah. What works for you until you can teach your child to do it on their own? Because the one thing I have discovered about resilient children is they have agency. Mm. They don't wait for us to do it. Mm -hmm. They finally figure out the strategies. And that's what we've got to help our kids learn is you've got it, but here's the strategy that'll help you get it. Mm -hmm. Practice and practice until you can do it all your own. Then they'll use it the rest of their lives. Yeah. That's so, I mean, so many practical pieces there that all seem like they're a cultural shift. I mean, like you said, they're all evidence-based, but because of the performance being so ingrained in our culture, I think it's that much more difficult at times. Well, I think the first step, you know, is you can't change your parenting or your teaching or anything unless you understand the why. Mm -hmm. And I always tell the school, I said, the, the most wonderful thing you could do is, and it won't take any more than a minute, is give every kid a survey and just fill out three things. Of what's the one thing you wish the teachers would, mm -hmm. what do you appreciate about the teachers? What's mm -hmm. the one thing you, you wish appreciate about your parents or wish they would do? What's the one feeling that you're having right now? And anxiety, stress, overwhelmed, always come up on the feeling. Mm -hmm. The one thing they appreciate about the teachers, it makes them cry every time. I just did this with Jacksonville, Florida, and they the kids came up. These were teens. The lunch lady. I love her because she sings all day. And I walk mm. into the lunchroom and she's singing. The, the custodian, because he says, have a good one, Spike. You're going to do it. The teacher who waits for me at the door and says, simple little mm -hmm. thing. And then I, I looked at the parents and I was, frankly, I was like, oh my gosh, what's the one thing you appreciate your parent or your family? I can't tell you how many times my dog came up on the list. Wow. My dog that my mom drives me to school. It wasn't the things we said. Mm -hmm. And we've got to maybe have some empathy for our children because they're really hurting right now. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that surveys are so, I mean, even just the naming it, as you mentioned, which goes back to, on the one hand, naming the things that are challenging, but naming the things that are giving life and giving yes. support yes. at the same time. So yes. important. So I also, I'm going to throw a little bit of an audible because this is a question that I've been curious about for some time. Um, obviously, I know you focus on the child development, but one thing that, again, just talking to kids that seems to come up sometimes is I hear them kind of talking about scenarios in the schools. Mm -hmm. And again, my, the neuroscientist in me automatically goes on to thinking, well, these teachers are spread very thin. Yes. And I'm not sure the teachers are actually attentive to their own stressors yes. and irritants and things like that. So is that something that comes up in conversation, even though I know yes. you focus on the child development? No, it's no. Also when I that do, awareness. I for the adults who are in it's the class. such a, a critical, critical comment because first of all, we are losing an enormous amount of teachers who are retiring. If there's mm. one thing every one of us should do is write a thank you note to a teacher mm. because th the reason that they got into teaching is because they love children and they want to make a difference. Just writing them a thank you is one of the best ways to reduce burnout. 
Mm. Second of all is at the end of every one of my speeches, I spend 30 minutes talking about now, what are you going to do? Take care of yourself. Mm. What's your one go to that works for you? I would suggest at schools that you do more uh, sunshine calls, just uh, just taking time for each other, collegiality, finding a support network. What is working for you? And in some cases, the counselor has a before school yoga group. That doesn't mean all teachers are going to do it. Yeah. For some teachers, uh, they say they really love um, books, bibliotherapy, getting into the shoes of a character who's been through a tough time and coming out to the other side, reading the book Educated can be enormous. Uh, Malala's books can be extraordinary. Of mm. Here's a kid who endured and got through. It helps the teacher realize resilience is something that you're not born with. Mm -hmm. You can acquire it. Mm -hmm. And we can help our children and it's doable. But once they begin to realize you can do it. I, I remember when I was writing the book Thrivers, each chapter has a real story about somebody who endured and made it to mm -hmm. an extraordinary tough time. And I remember when I was writing the chapter on empathy, I was reading about Elizabeth Smart. Here is a girl who went through nine months of absolute terror, mm -hmm. kidnapped uh, a knife uh, in her bedroom and then horrific horrors of horrors but the one chapter that just it was the stop moment how did she endure it she said it was the second day of captivity when all of a sudden I remembered something my mother said to me she came crystal clear into my head and she said Elizabeth no matter what remember I will always love you no matter whatever happens I'm always mm. there for you and I said if my mother is always going to love me for who I am I'm going to be able to get through it. She says that gave me the fortitude mm. to keep going. Wow. Wow. That's so powerful. Yeah. So I think we forget those ordinary things and it's like, go home and hug your kid, but tell them I'm here for you. No matter mm -hmm. what happens, I love you for who you are. Yeah. And so, so easy for us to, to slip out of that. I think that ties everything together. What you've been talking about, both from the kids and from our expectations as we all kind of get spread in, in those places. So. Wow, just I mean, I just feel like you just need just to pause there and just really take that in because I think that comment even of itself can go such a long way. Um, but the other thing which really stand up, stands out from what you're talking about is just the learning that happens, the learning of the resilience. Now you now you talked about that with empathy as well. So I'd also want to get to your new book, but maybe to park on this empathy piece for a little bit and just have you elaborate on what you've learned about really teaching that and how that can be developed and kind of stick for the long term, what are some of the principles that have come up in your work? I think it was dealing with, um, well, it was once again, a moment that just changed my life. It was uh, sitting on a bench in the Cambodian killing fields. Mm. And it, it was, I had a, an, I was crying so hard. I had a nosebleed because there in front of me was a tree with these little ribbons on it. And each ribbon stood for a child who had been slaughtered on that tree because they were crying. Next to me wow. was a monolith of five stories high of skulls. And I could not believe anybody could be so evil. And that was that president was a former teacher who set the evil. So that's doable. I, I couldn't believe it. I happened to walk off the killing fields and there was a little teeny uh, table that was selling a few books. And there was my, oh my gosh, <laughs> my, I picked it up. It was by Samuel Alliner, one of the most amazing social psychologists. His family had been slaughtered in Germany during the Holocaust. Mm. And a perfect woman just didn't know anyone or him. Samuel was 12 at the time. Her name was Bowinda. She said, Samuel, come in here. I need to save you. Run as fast as you can. His family went off to a death camp. She mm. saved his life. And now the entire rest of his life, he's trying to figure out what makes Bowindas of the world. Mm. Not the evil, what mm. flips the other side. And what he did was extraordinary. He's interviewed hundreds of rescuers, mm. Christians during World War II who, who risked their life to save a Jewish people. Mm. Why, he said. And the commonality of each one of them were three things. I call them the three E's. Every one of them said it was how I was raised. What, mm. Whoa, how were you wow. raised? The first thing was example. They saw my dad or I saw my mom. She always really was the example of empathy or kindness. Mm. The second thing was expectations. In our family, you were expected to be kind. You were expected to do good. 
The third one was experiences. My dad would would walk, would walk it. My mom would say it. But then we did experiences. So we would deliver overcoats to a needy mm-hmm. family or we'd bake cookies to the neighbor next door. Those three things started to build empathy. So each person said, I saw myself as a caring person. What mm-hmm. the parents were doing was mm-hmm. changing the child's mindset. Yeah. So now they see themselves as a caring person. You act how you see yourself to be. Mm-hmm. And I think what we've done is we put so much of our mindset into the GPA and the test score that when the kid comes home, we rarely say, oh, what good thing did you do? As opposed to what grade did you get? Mm-hmm. It doesn't mean you're going to stop asking, uh, are you studying your hardest? But it also means this what is I expect you to do. My The lesson from it all is that empathy can be cultivated. Mm. And the research now is clear that our we're, our children are hardwired for it. Mm. But unless we really make it a little more intentional in today's world in particular, it's going to lie dormant. And mm. I swear, after especially after two years of physical distancing and looking at a screen as opposed to face-to-face, because the pathway to empathy is looking at someone and going, how would she feel? How do I feel? Mm-hmm. That emotional literacy piece starts the trajectory towards I'm going to reach out and help. Mm. So those are the things yeah. that I learned. And that's, that's why great. I wrote on selfie. I went, okay, if this is doable, then what are the habits that we can start teaching? And let's mm. make it easy. Uh, and I, one of the most critical ones is besides instilling in your child the caring mindset, we need to talk feelings far more naturally to our kids. Yeah. We can watch inside out with our older kids. We can say, how are you doing today? We can say, sit here and watch dad's face. And when he walks in and you'll know if this is a good time to ask him for the allowance or not, it can be extremely wonderful <laughs> moments. But you can also, for some children, they're a little nervous about saying the emotion. Mm. So you can do what an ER doctor says and he always says, how bad's the pain? Show mm-hmm. me with your fingers. A zero is you could be asleep. It's so, you're so relaxed. A seven, you're about ready to explode because the pain is so bad. But you can do that with your children. Your children can give you, I'm at a three, mom. Thank you for telling me, sweetie. Let's figure out how to get it to a two or a one. Mm. You know? Yeah. It's, it's that That's empathy good. piece of us trying to empathize with our kids. Yeah. It's the starter point. Then we start helping them learn emotions we start helping them not see it in themselves, but how would you feel if that happened to you? What does mm-hmm. she need in order to feel better? What can you do? You watch TV, it's just gloriously, just horrific stuff. But you can also say, what can we do to help? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a good idea. I know you're you're really upset by that, but let's go collect some. Let's get a, keep a box by your back door. It's a charity box for your family. And it's for gently used toys and books and whatever, backpacks, and each time it's filled, your family, not you, mom, Mm -hmm. dad, your family delivers it to someone in need. Every child said it was the look in the other person's eye that said, I got to keep doing this. Mm -hmm. That's so, so well said. I mean, I love so many pieces of that, just the three E's that you shared too. I mean, I've been thinking about the example and the experience together. Because as you're talking about parents really tuning in with their children, but then also having time to say as parents, well, this is what I'm feeling in this moment. And yes. to have the kids also yes. learn from that example. And again, you know, I keep kind of moving back to the college sphere because that's the space that I live in. But I've even seen that on campus in a lot of ways, too, with a lot of the social justice issues that have been going mm-hmm. on with students who have said, oh, I've never heard my professors actually talk about their own struggles with this oh, or yes, create yeah. this space. Yeah. To have those conversations. So as those things are beginning to happen, it seems like even though this is a later developmental stage, there's places for people to actually build community and empathy with one another because they can now both see where they're coming from and then tie into so many of those practical outcomes that you're talking about as well. Well, I think the trajectory from me to we, and that's where we're aiming for, oh, mm-hmm. I hope we're aiming for as mm-hmm. a society, is to listen to other people's stories, to realize mm-hmm. how much we have in common with them. When a child says he's different, no, let's find out how we're the same. Mm-hmm. I, it's too often that sped apart and we're becoming so divisive as a group. We can't. We've got to figure out, look at the kind of books you're reading to your children. Make sure that you're reading different genders, different mm-hmm. races, different mm-hmm. incomes, different possibilities, because books, books, literary fiction are known to be able to open up your empathy. Mm-hmm. Ah, OK. You, they also help you in terms of learning, but you find the right book. That's mm. why Wonder is one of the most popular books for children right now, yeah. because they feel with that one. character. 
Yeah. I ask middle school kids, what's the one book that teachers should always, always, always help kids read? And I'm blown away that they say The Outsiders. I went, that's 50 years old. Why? (laughs) I I love their answer because we've got to understand what it feels like to be excluded. Mm. How glorious to have that as an answer. And that means that you're exposing kids and then you're doing something wonderful, like you did, having the space to be able to talk about it. Mm -hmm. Have those dialogues where a kid knows it's okay to open up and and to be assertive because that's another trait of resilient children. They have voice. Mm. Mm. Yeah, so important. I love, I mean, it just as we're talking through this, is one of those I'm definitely gonna have to go back and listen to because I think you're bringing so many things to life. And like you said, there's so much evidence for it, but to just to hear it in this context and be reminded of, it, I think is so important. Oh. There's so many practical pieces that we can pull out of it. Thank you. Well, that was the goal. The goal was really after listening to my dad, I, I saw two huge needs. And I think it was again, I started to do focus groups mm-hmm. uh, with teens. And I never realized prior to the pandemic, how struggling, uh, they were struggling, they were hurting, their anxiety, their stress, even though they were loved to death, their opportunities were endless. But something was really amiss with the kids. And then the pandemic hit. Well, a crisis only amplifies a pre-existing issue. And therefore, the CDC and the Surgeon General's reports on mental health needs are are critical. But it also means, hey, folks, we've got to reset what we're doing here. We have to reset what we're thinking. And this is um, when I wrote the last one, Thrivers, was empathy was what I did was to choose the seven most highly correlated strengths that Mm. research in all the work on resilience says are teachable that will impact mental health, resilience and peak performance. Of course, number two on the list was empathy, because I don't think you can go anywhere without empathy. Mm -hmm. But the first on the list was confidence. Mm -hmm. The child needs to know who they are, what their passion is that we talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. And we've driven that passion out of it. Many kids said we're being driven to be what my parents want me to be, Mm -hmm. not who I am. I think that's so essential. The third one we already talked about, too, is self-control. Unless you can figure out how to put the brake on impulses and do that one, two breath or whatever works for you. A fourth is integrity. That would be what Samuel Allender discovered. Those parents knew exactly what the kind of kid they wanted to turn out of that house. Mm -hmm. In this house, we're going to have be kind. We're going to be caring. We're going to be socially responsible. Empathy and social responsible were the two highest correlated values of a home that raises a kid who's altruist. Wow. But they kept going that over and over again. Mm Uh, And then the fifth one is curiosity. We've helicoptered our kids to death. We've solved every problem for them. There goes the agency. Mm -hmm. So curiosity is helping the kid be creative and open to ideas and possibilities. So when the challenge comes, you're not dumb, you figure out what am I going to do instead? Mm -hmm. Mom's not going to help me this time. She's going to teach me how to brainstorm. Mm -hmm. What's the problem? What's one thing you could have done differently and another thing? Fifth is, uh, sixth is perseverance. Now you're going to keep on going because you've got all these other little skills right. along the way. And you're going to realize your effort is what gets you moving, not your GPA or your zip code. And the final one is optimism and hope. Mm. We don't instill that in a child, particularly in today's world and the images that they're seeing. Yeah. After a while, a lot of them are going to start raising a white flag of I surrender. Yeah. Why should I do it? And I give yeah. up. That's not the kind of child we want. Yeah. We want a strong kid who knows the world is going to be okay. Mm-hmm. And uh, there's things that you can do to make it okay. Yeah. And again, just backed up by all the research and tying that full circle, especially ending with that hope, as you mentioned before, too. There, yeah. I mean, there's so many, so many good things that you're doing. I think there's a lot that the listeners will be able to digest here and to re-listen to as well. And you've talked about this already, but I'm curious, you know, with all these efforts, what's the, what's the, the piece that brings you the most joy in this work? The kids. It happened. It's I. I didn't realize because I was the like you, the the person that was just reading the research and research off to mm-hmm. the side. I've got a pile this big, and I just keep reading it, reading it. Reading. And then I go and talk to the kids, and I go, my gosh, that's exactly <laughs> what the research said. It's like, why don't we just talk to the kids? But yeah. they also have solutions, mm-hmm. simple little things that they suggest. And so um, there isn't a time when I can be exhausted getting off a plane. But if I know I'm going to do a focus group, I get rejuvenated going, Mm. that's the next generation and there's hope. Yeah. Yeah. In some ways, I mean, even I'm tying back to your dad again, too. But 
you're building community in so many ways with all the lives that you're touching. And it really just makes oh, me well, think about the way that people invested in your dad and what you're doing for others and the community you're building around that. So, well, um, thank you. Just, it's been a joy. Uh, it's still a ride. And the more yeah. every time you turn on the news, you realize this is more relevant now than ever. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, I, I think the piece that if there's one takeaway here, resilience is not a program and one trait. I see mm. that a lot. It's not mm. locked into your DNA. This is something that research says can be done. It isn't an overnight process mm-hmm. either. So we can all relax. This is a new thing of a new parenting and educational plan that we've got to weave in. And we weave it into not like at six o'clock when to talk about resilience, but we weave it into our discipline, the books mm-hmm. we read, the talks we have with our kids. We just need to be a little more intentional and yeah. know this is important and we can do it. Find one little tip you want to weave in and do that every day, a minute a day. And uh, I think that's how we start raising stronger kids. Yeah, that's so well said, that intentionality. And as you emphasize throughout, one step at a time, not everything at once, but just really being able to bake it in, in a yeah. sense. And well, as a final question, and this has been a joy just having you here for oh. your inspiration and encouragement. Where could people go to find out more resources? either about you, your books, or just resources in general around these topics? Um, well, my my website is michelleborba.com. I'm a 1L Michelle and Borba runs the Zorba. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Thrivers is the latest book that will be out in paperback um, March 8th in, in uh, digital form, audio form, uh, also paperback. So it's, I think what I tried to do is make this nugget proof kind of simple stuff so mm-hmm. you never hopefully read an entire book of mine in one sitting. Instead, mm-hmm. crack it open. There's a test at the beginning of which of those strengths is your children's strengths or weakness. Mm-hmm. Not you see it as a weakness, but you see it as there's where I'm going to start. And then just keep looking at it as one particular ongoing plan. The other thing I think we do wrong is we try to do it ourselves. Mm. Get a grandmother involved. Get the daycare worker involved. Pass it on to the teacher. Here's the one little thing I'm working on this month. And you'll Mm -hmm. always optimize your gains with your child. Mm. Yeah, great advice. Great advice. Well, thank you so much for being here on the Addy Hour for all the uh, encouragement and inspiration. And just the practical tips that you share with our listeners, too, I know. This is one that people will be grateful for. And I think you're going to be able to share with others and also listen to a few times to catch catch all of these nuances and some of these practical tips as well. So thanks so much for being here. Oh, thank you. Best to you. Stay well. You too.